So, hello dear colleague again. As I told, my name is Andrei Chup, and I'm an organizer of this uh, webinar. Uh, so, again, I'm pleased to see that we have over 160 participants, and this number is only increasing, uh, which is great for number of attendees. Moreover, uh, we expect uh, also some people from uh, doctoral school Doctoral School of Energy and Geotechnology joining today. Uh, I would like to underline that this webinar was uh, organized by Estonian section, a joint society's chapter that I am chair of. Uh, we, this society chapter unites industrial electronics, power electronics, industry application, as well as uh, power and energy societies in Estonia. This is a recently reformatted chapter. Uh, there is a support, technical support with this Zoom uh, recording from uh, Tallinn University of Technology and uh, especially Zero Energy Center of Excellence that we have here in Tallinn in Estonia. I am very pleased uh, to see that uh, we have got uh, an excellent speakers. Today first uh, talk will be given by Professor Gianpaolo Butiki representing University of Nottingham, uh, their campus in Ningbo. Uh, I was uh, blessed to work with him also previously in Germany, University of Kiel. Uh, he was working in several other universities before settling in China, and right now he he's uh, in charge of topics of uh, power electronics for uh, aerospace systems as well as uh, reliability and active thermal control, which will be the main uh, topic of his talk today. After that, we will hear the talk of Professor Hassan Komurzugil, representing Eastern Mediterranean University from Turkey. Uh, Professor Komurchugil is an expert in sliding mode control. We decided to get this topic on this webinar in order to introduce you, because as, as was written online, that this webinar mostly intended for master and PhD students to provide a short introduction point of reference for you uh, regarding the new and new as well as existing but still popular control methods. Uh, so, Professor Komurchugil is one of the leaders of sliding mode control of second wave of popularity right now. Uh, after that, Professor Jose Rodriguez from Chile, from Andres Bello University, will join us, and uh, he is well known expert in model predictive control. He will also provide a short introduction, and this webinar will be concluded by my talk on um, topology morphing control intended for galvanically isolated DC DC converters. Uh, seeing the number of participants of approaching 200 people. I am not sure if we will have uh, any meaningful Q&A sessions because those are short uh, introductory presentations, but still we will be provided with some point of reference and in the future you can contact our speakers uh, if you find the interest in their research and want to get more information or as well as you could be referred to their recent and uh, existing papers published because all of us are actively publishing in these topics. And at this point, I think I can stop sharing this webinar poster and give the floor to Professor Gianpaolo Buticchi. Gianpaolo, can you unmute yourself and try to share your screen, please? Okay. <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes, excellent. Okay, so first uh, point success. And can you also can you also see the screen? Yes, absolutely. All right. Thank you very much, Andre, for the introduction and for organizing this webinar. You know how I miss the face-to-face -face conferences and, uh, and discussions, uh, but very happy to be with uh, this audience uh, and with you sharing some of the topics or uh, some of the research topics that are, uh, I like. So today <clears throat> I'm going to talk about active thermal control. And okay, for more reliable power electronics, title is quite general, and we will see a couple of things that I I consider pretty interesting, and I, I enjoy the research of this. This work started in, uh, in Germany when I was at the University of Kiel with Marco Lizer and Marcus Andresen, and now the active thermal control family has expanded uh, to well, like to Spain with uh, Abraham Marquez, Leopoldo Franquello, and in Leone, to Italy with Vito Monopoli, 
So there's uh, quite some researchers around the world, uh, also in China and Nottingham, UK, doing research on this topic. So I will try to provide a brief overview on the subject. This is a brief outline. I'm gonna give a couple of examples, and then I will focus more on this power routing, that is this active thermal control technique specific for modular power converters. And is one of the most interesting, I think, where we researchers, we can have a lot of fun because of the many degrees of freedom. Okay, let's start with the first topic. First of all, I didn't invent active thermal control. Active thermal control, the, if we look back, the first publication was from Rockwell Automation. So we're talking about uh, industry. So active thermal control started from the industry. It was not a research uh, born uh, from university. And the idea was to manipulate uh, the frequency, the switching frequency of the power electronics uh, to do what? Well, usually to try to squeeze a little bit more of juice from the power electronics. Indeed, when we design or when we are the bachelor degree or master degree and we see the first equation for the design of the power electronics, we are told, uh, yes, consider the maximum junction temperature, consider the steady state. But if you can play a bit with the control variable, then you can still operate safely below the maximum junction temperature and at the same time, try to overload a bit the power electronics to achieve more power, more torque. And expanding a bit more, the first journal article that we have found dates back to 2006. And the idea is to uh, change a bit the parameters of the electrical drives depending on the region. So we still manipulate the switch and frequency depending on the region. And the idea is always to work at the maximum allowed limits of the power electronics to get the maximum power or to fit some performance indicators. If we check the basic outline, if we check the basic outline of one of the system we have, so what do we need? We have the control, the basic control of the power electronics, for example, the current control. We have the PWM, all these PWM converters, and then we are plugging in an additional layer that is made of thermal modeling, losses modeling, device modeling, and then a uh, thermal control. And the objective of the thermal control uh, can be, well, can be whatever we want, depending on which target we want to optimize, or depending on which application or which is the most critical aspect. For example, here we can see that by getting the, some measurements from the physical system and the device characteristic, the loss model, we can estimate the junction temperature and then use this information as an input for the thermal control. For example, to change the switching frequency of the PWM converter. When we started this, we tried to categorize the different kinds of active thermal control depending on the action time, depending on the time constant. And we found like four, at least this was our initial classification. We can have a very fast gate driver active thermal control that operates in the range of microsecond. We can have something at the modulator level, so changing the pattern of the gating of the devices, maybe to optimize, for example, the temperature of some devices compared to others. We all know, for example, that the neutral point converter has not a uniform loss distribution. 
we can think of modifying the modulation, for example, to have a uniform temperature distribution and a lot more. We can have the power electronics controller, and that was the example for this from uh, local automation. So changing the switching frequency, change online the switching frequency to achieve some targets. And then we have the system level controller. That is the controller that distributes, for example, the references of the set points to the different controllers, to the different inner controllers. A couple of application examples to see what we are talking about. Uh, one of the first system controllers that we thought was a modified maximum power point tracker for photovoltaic power system. This also has some, uh, I don't know, emotional feeling because I did the thesis on photovoltaics, so it felt uh, nice also to expand a different topic on the photovoltaic power electronics. So if we check the literature then regarding reliability, we can see that one of the most important stressors, so one of the most important things that they kill the power electronics is the thermal cycling. Because of the different layers with which the power modules they are built, different materials, they lead to different thermal expansion coefficients and this heating up and cooling down cause mechanical fatigue that after some time, it goes to the, well, several failure modes. We can have the bond wire lift off, we can have the solder cracking, but this is, okay, this is something that we find in the literature regarding reliability. We, power electronics, we active thermal control engineers, we take these models and then we try to operate the power electronics in such a way that uh, we minimize uh, these stressors. For example, here we thought that the maximum power point tracking should not uh, just care about optimizing the maximum power point, but also paying attention to the, to the thermal behavior of the power electronics. Indeed, during our cloudy days, if you look at the output of the photovoltaic plant is not very big, but the converter is maybe changing from maximum power, no power, maximum power, low power. So these heating up and cooling down can damage the power electronics. So we said, let's do something crazy. Let's reduce the maximum power that we can do in order to preserve the power electronics. Let's add a limitation of the maximum derivative of the temperature. So what we see is that we can indeed control the temperature derivative. These are actual junction temperature measurements with an infrared camera. So we are able to control how fast the power electronics is heating up. And if we see if we use this during a cloudy day, we see that the damage of the power electronics during a cloudy day is greatly reduced. Then how much do we want to reduce? This is an optimization target. Do we want to still get in some power or some relevant power, or do we want to preserve the power electronics lifetime? Depending on the weight of different coefficients, we get some different results. For example, here we could see that we can reduce the, the junction temperature, we can increase the lifetime of the power electronics given these parameters. So this is a tool, active thermal control is a tool. We can affect the thermal behavior and the reliability. How aggressive you want to implement this active thermal control is an optimization output. Okay, 
So this was the first application. Then uh, another application, just to give the feeling, can be the switching frequency control. In this, this, is, this was the first application that we tried with the first H bridge that, uh, that we built in Kiel. So the idea is very simple. You have a variable mission profile, you have heating up and cooling down. So we can try to do something, I don't know, crazy. We can try to increase the switching frequency to reduce the efficiency of the power electronics when it is cooling down. So we are preventing the power electronics from cooling down too much. Then we can have uh, some more uh, refined control. So we are doing it only when the, when the power difference is like decreasing, but not when it's increasing. So the idea is to reduce the thermal cycling, is to reduce the cooling down only for the short time intervals. No, of course, not for the very long one. Then you let the power electronics cool down and operate at the maximum efficiency point. So what we can see is that if we compare the, this uh, top waveform, where we have a variable mission profile and constant switching frequency, we have different junction temperatures for the diodes and the transistors. Instead, if we apply this active thermal control and we let the frequency range from 10 to 30 kilohertz, for example, you see that the frequency increases when the power goes down. We see, in fact, that all the thermal cycles are almost eliminated, but the big and longer thermal cycles, they are, they are still there because we don't want to decrease too much the efficiency of the system. Again, how much we decide to act on the power electronics is a matter of optimization. For example, here we could see that by decreasing the efficiency by 1%, we can either increase the lifetime by 40% or reduce the current rating by 22%. And by the way, this is very easy to implement. It's a, couple of lines in the modulator of your DSP. So it is an interesting tool, I believe. In this case, we were changing one of the modulator parameter, the switching frequency, to reshape the losses. It sounds like that may make sense or may not make sense, depending on the application. I mean, active thermal control is a tool. It depends on what we are using it for. Then we come to one of my favorite topics, the power routing. Power routing is a system level controller for modular power electronics. The idea here, I don't know what is happening to this. Okay. Yeah, sometimes I don't know why I lose the control of the, of the presentation. So let's just consider a modular repairable system. Okay. Is the typical case of the smart transformers, so the solid state transformers used to replace the medium voltage to low voltage a conventional power transformer in order to implement smart grid features to the low voltage, medium voltage, and also DC grids. So these systems, they need to undergo some maintenance cycle. So we can imagine that the cells, they will have some different lifetime because this is how, how it works. You must ensure some safe operation within the next maintenance cycle, and then there can be some repair or changing. So one of the assumptions that normally are made that all the cells, they are equal, same parameter, same lifetime, 
for this kind of application is not uh, holding anymore. So if we consider this case, then we have that the optimal power sharing may not be the equal one. So in the power routing paradigm, the idea is that each cell should process a power depending on its state of health. So not only the efficiency, but also the state of health. So the powers, they may be different. So what can we do for this? One of the most interesting things that uh, we thought of is the power routing for the maintenance scheduling. Because we can think that uh, the best way could be to optimize the failure so that uh, all the things to equalize the lifetime. This was the first idea that we thought, but then we thought that also it was not the best thing because if you have some new cells and some old cell, then this would lead to an overstress of the new cells. And then you have at some point that all the cells, they are expected to fail together. You know, it doesn't seem, doesn't seem too promising, but we can do something else. So if we have the control over the reliability of the single cell, in particular for the devices or the capacitors, then we can optimize the power sharing to achieve some targets. We can think, for example, to, well, equalize the points of the, of the failure of the devices and the capacitor so that at least we are using one cell at the maximum of its capability. We can think of equalizing some of the failure times of the cells so that at least when we perform the maintenance, then we didn't leave unused any of the residual lifetime of the cells. So maybe we squeeze more power or maybe we delay a bit more the maintenance. So this is the framework we are considering, having the control over the failure of the cells, or at least when we say having the control over the a statistical process, a stochastical process, then we are saying to try to reduce the variance. Of course, we will never get to the point where we say, okay, this cell will fail in 10 seconds. No, but reducing the variance of the failure would be super beneficial for the maintenance planning. So this is a different concept of the on-off control. On-off control usually is adopted for the efficiency maximization. It's uh, something adopted in the CDC converter and it works, it maximizes the efficiency, but sometimes uh, the efficiency maximization may not be what we want to do. So this is a bit too two different uh, optimization processes. Do we want uh, the maximum efficiency? Do we want uh, the lifetime? Or do we want a mix of both, so depending on the conditions? These are a few examples. So let's say that uh, during normal operation of a smart transformer, this would be the failure distribution. Indeed, we don't really like that the cells are, like, are failing because a failure lead to electromagnetic transient uh, or maybe some cross coupling between the cells. So um, fault tolerance, yes, is something we can do, but fault avoidance is probably a better approach. If you have done some uh, modular converters, especially in the lab, then you see that when one fails and explodes, then maybe some debris, they go exactly on the gate driver of the other cell and they destroy it. This is why in many applications, the converters they are sealed. So at least to limit the debris creation in cases of explosion. But so let's say 
having a fault happening is something that uh, if it can be avoided or its occurrence can be avoided, it would be nice. So for example, we could think of having some fault grouping. So adding that the expected failure of the cells, they are grouped. So we can have the maintenance safely before these are expected faults, so minimizing the occurrence of the fault and unwanted transient, and also minimizing the uh, minimizing um, the number of maintenance event. Or maybe, like uh, I don't know, when we are uh, running and uh, we really want to give everything we can because that's the last bit of the run, maybe we may need that to delay the maintenance. I don't know, maybe because in that moment it is not possible to get the maintenance crew and then we need to delay it by a few months. So what are we doing? We are, can think of using some of the lifetime of these, let's say, better in shape cells using the VDARP to delay this maintenance event, because maybe here we cannot afford having maintenance. So this is the idea, having the control and use it to better plan of the maintenance. We run several tests in the lab, also several uh, uh, Monte Carlo simulation, so what we see is that if we want to group the, the lifetime and having that some cells, they fail at a specific time, we can do it. The cell loading can change according to the state of the elements. Why should they be different? Well, there is, of course, some statistical variation in the, uh, in the lifetime of the individual cells. There can be some small variations of the, of the cooling, it's true. We can do also the control over the cooling. There can be different uh, mm, thermal performance of the interface material, so that equal power leads to an equal junction temperature. So there can be a number of, of cases where this can happen. So by having a good estimation of the state of health, we can use power routing to group the failures. This is one of my favorite slides because it really explains what, so which should be the objective of this uh, active thermal control. If we just uh, live uh, in many cases when, without lifetime control, we get uh, to a uh, mean time to failure and some variance. If we apply the lifetime control, then we get basically to the same mean time to failure, but the variance is, is much smaller. So this is what I think is very cool. We don't want to be able to optimize up to the second uh, the failure because it's, it's impossible. We will never have this accuracy of the estimation of the thermal model. But if we can do something in a modular structure to reduce the variance, then it's already a huge win in my opinion. Already with this kind of simple uh, sharing algorithm, then we are already gaining for example, a couple of years in the maintenance. And also we can group much better, the variance is like divided by half, the, the, the failures. So reducing the variance of the failure is what we say is to control the failure. And this is what can be done now. But of course, the more the technology improves, the thermal models, the reliability estimation, the control of the power electronics, I think that this should be like a goal to be able to always squeeze a bit more the variance to really have a very good design for reliability of the power electronics. 
avoiding the overdesign because overdesign means weight, and especially for aerospace system, weight is uh, everything. And uh, also have a better plan of the maintenance. Now, when we started doing this, of course, and we started presenting it at the conference, then our smart people, they, they started to criticize it. This is very good about science that you think you have a cool idea, then you present it, and then people, they start finding the problems. And then you start finding solutions to these problems. This is one of the amazing things about uh, scientific research. So which can be the problem? The problem is that if you start operating the, the modular converters with a different, uh, with a different uh, power, then what you get is that many of the very nice things uh, about the many of the very nice things about the power, the modular power converters are lost. Indeed, we know that the cascaded H bridge works very well if all the cells, they have the same modulation index, the same voltage. Parallel DC-DC converter, they work very well if they have the same power, the phase shift between the carriers. So, and in many other cases, for example, the capacitors, if we are having this unequal power sharing, uh, for example, between multiple parallel DC-DC structures, then maybe the ripple of the capacitor is increasing. So we believe that we are doing something good for the power electronics by controlling the maintenance, but we are destroying the capacitor because the ripple increases. Well, Luckily, there seems to be solutions for this. So let's check, let's check this. So we have a cascaded, have a cascaded H bridge, and we have like the output current of interleaved DC-DC converters. If we switch from balanced power transfer to unbalanced power transfer, well, we see immediately that the moment we switch to this unbalanced power transfer, the output waveform is not good. If we check the spectrum, we see that the very nice frequency multiplication effect of the phase shift modulation of the CHB is lost. So instead of operating at an equivalent switching frequency of six kilohertz, we have harmonic components at two kilohertz, four ki or four and four kilohertz. So this would Im impact uh, very badly the, the output current quality. And the same for uh, the DC-DC converters. So this is the output capacitor current. We really like that we have this high frequency, 15 kilohertz, very nice. But then other frequencies appear. So this may have effect on the reliability and also on the power quality. So yes, power routing is good because we can control the reliability, but we may be paying a big price for this. Yes or no? Well, it depends. It depends because we can modify the modulation strategies of all these power converters to take into account the power routing. So for, of course, for details, uh, you can, uh, I'm gonna share the, the presentation and you find all in the, in the paper because it's, uh, there is quite some mass, double Fourier integral. But if we are taking into account that the modulation that the power sharing is not equal, then we can implement some mitigation technique. We can implement some variable angle pulse width modulation. So at each modulation uh, uh, period, we are changing dynamically the angle of the carriers of the PWM modulators of each individual cells in order to uh, 
re-improve the power quality. We can say, for example, that all these low order harmonics at uh, two kilohertz, they are disappearing, or at least they are strongly mitigated. And we go back to having a higher frequency. Also the same can be seen with the variable angle PWN. We are reshifting a bit of the, of the current harmonics to higher frequencies. So there is something that can be done. And indeed, we, we have been doing it extensively. So I can keep the time. I don't know if I'm on time or uh, too soon or too late. Apologies. So what I showed in this presentation is the introduction of active thermal control. And the basic idea is very simple. We are doing something in the power electronics. We are changing electrical parameters of the power electronics that can be at the gate, a modulator, control, or reference generation system to affect the thermal performance. Of course, it's not the only way. You can also think of having, for example, uh, the control of the of the water flow or the cooling system. But active thermal control refers, in this case, to the electrical parameters. So the first um, cases, the first examples are quite straightforward. If we move to modular architectures and modular architectures, especially for uh, big applications or uh, mission critical applications, they are probably, there are probably uh, mandatory choices also in order to have some fault tolerance because random failures, they are hardly uh, being avoided. We always need to think that there can be a random failure for whichever reason, cosmic rays, for example. So once we have a modular architecture, we can think of uh, controlling individually the power sharing of the cells to perform advanced control. In particular, the maintenance control is one of the most interesting in my opinion, because maintenance is money. And uh, sometimes it can be as expensive, uh, I don't know, a good fraction of the power converters, the maintenance cost. So if we can do something to optimize it, then it's already a big win. Also, there is a lot of research in mitigating the downsides of these thermal controls on the performance. So I hope that I didn't bore you and uh, I will be sharing the presentations. There are the references to all the papers if you're interested to look on how this was uh, implemented and done. So, Thanks for the attention and thank you, Andre, for giving me the, the chance to present this. Yeah, thank you, Gianpaolo, for the presentation. It was a really fascinating results obtained in this field. And I think that for many of our attendees, which I would like to mention, we have around 200 right now, that's going to be an interesting point of reference to start their research if they're going to pursue this. and. Uh, you, you are almost in time, and but now we need to switch to uh, Professor Hassan Komurcugil from uh, Mediterranean Eastern University of Turkey. So, Professor Hassan, I see you have unmuted yourself. Please try sharing the screen. Oh, excellent. Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay, Andre, thank you very much for your nice presentation. And uh, I would say good morning to the West and good afternoon to the East. I hope uh, all over the world we have uh, many attendees. Uh, as you have mentioned, I will talk about sliding mode control of uh, power converters. Uh, so, 
I will start with uh, introduction and then uh, sliding mode control, uh, design of the sliding mode control, okay, uh, how to design uh, sliding mode. Then I will talk about some uh, applications in the power converters and I will conclude my presentation uh, by giving some features and uh, disadvantages of the sliding mode control. Okay, so uh, I prepared my presentation as, as simple as possible uh, by uh, assuming that uh, most of the uh, presenters are uh, masters and PhD students. So as we all know, uh, the uh, converters, they contain uh, passive components, uh, diodes and switches. And uh, power converters, uh, in this case, they belong to variable structure systems uh, because uh, their uh, structure is always changed by switches. So uh, sliding mode control is quite uh, suitable for power converters. Uh, as, a, as I will explain in the, in the next slide, uh, the idea is uh, to, to force uh, the st system states uh, to make a motion on the sliding surface using this continuous control. And by this uh, way, uh, the, the, we will have two different system structures. Uh, sliding mode control is nonlinear control. It, it is uh, appeared uh, uh, as an alternative uh, to non uh, to linear control approaches, and therefore, uh, as being nonlinear control, uh, it is it has some uh, advantages which has in, which has been mentioned below. Uh, initially, it was proposed by Vadim Mutkin in 1977. However, uh, its effectiveness was not realized for a long time. Uh, what are the advantages uh, of this sliding mode control? First of all, uh, as, uh, as we want uh, in most of the uh, control methods, we want fast dynamic response. This is first objective. Uh, then uh, we have robustness. Uh, the, performance of the uh, controller uh, is not sensitive to the parameter variations. Uh, this is second objective. And the, uh, the third one is the implementation simplicity. So uh, it is quite easy. And the other property is order reduction. So uh, second system uh, can be uh, implemented as first or third system could be implemented as a second order. Uh, more importantly, uh, the sliding mode control, uh, unlike the classical or linear uh, control method, it doesn't need a mathematical model of the system. So this is uh, very important. Uh, so these were uh, these are the uh, advantages. However, uh, there are also some uh, disadvantages, uh, and one of the disadvantages is chattering. Uh, chattering uh, occurs uh, in the form of uh, zigzag movements uh, on the sliding line. Uh, so uh, when you have chattering. It means that you have time varying switching frequency, and uh, time varying switching frequency uh, is not uh, desired in uh, in industry and in practical applications. And uh, because of this uh, chattering uh, effect, uh, sliding mode uh, control converters uh, are not widely used in industrial applications. Uh, however, uh, there are many methods uh, available in the literature 
uh, which um, uh, aim to uh, reduce uh, the effect of chattering. So in this presentation, uh, I will uh, talk about uh, sliding mode control of DC to DC, DC to AC, and AC to DC converters. Uh, am I going fast or it's okay? Uh, I think it is okay. As, as I told that uh, we have half an hour, I think you will be in time with that. Okay. So uh, when we say sliding mode control, we can uh, talk about a general blurb diagram, uh, which is taken from our recent publication in Industrial Electronics Magazine. So we can uh, uh, divide sliding mode control into two categories, continuous time and discrete time. And if you design uh, uh, sliding mode control in continuous time, then you have to uh, pay attention to the uh, sliding surface design, uh, sliding coefficient selection, uh, control input design, then uh, chattering reduction and modulation. Um, sliding surface design can be uh, uh, linear or nonlinear. Uh, sliding coefficient selection uh, could be uh, using intuitive method or based on analytical method. Uh, control input design uh, can be based on equivalent control or reaching low. And chattering reduction uh, techniques, uh, the available techniques are using high stresses function, boundary layer method, state observer method, and uh, super twisting method. And the modulation techniques are uh, high stresses, sinusoidal, adaptive, and space vector. So in this presentation, uh, we will continue. We will talk about uh, the sliding mode in continuous time. Uh, as I said, uh, most of the people, uh, they are interested in working in sliding mode control. Uh, but uh, they are not successful uh, in, the, uh, in, in their first attempt to design sliding mode control. So I decided to present uh, this simplest uh, structure uh, using this DCDC converter topology. Uh, in this topology, we have a single switch, as you can see, and we have on the right hand side uh, the mathematical uh, model uh, and in this model there are two switching states x1 and x2 uh, x1 is the uh, voltage error and x2 is the uh, derivative of the voltage error as you can see so uh, we form sliding surface by using x1 and its derivative as you can see here. And if we uh, try to simulate this system uh, by uh, giving, uh, uh, by opening and closing a switch where U corresponds to uh, uh, when the switch is open and uh, U z equal to zero corresponds to when the switch is closed. So we have different uh, uh, trajectories, as you can see. Uh, the difference uh, comes from the fact that we have different initial conditions. So if you look at this uh, figure, uh, we can see that uh, for when the switch is uh, open, we have a state trajectory uh, around this line that we can see. And also when we have a switch closed where U is equal to one, we have such uh, state trajectories. So this means that when we combine these uh, trajectories, uh, switch closed, switch open, we will have uh, uh, X1 and X2 uh, moving uh, towards origin uh, on this line. And this line is called uh, sliding line. And uh, when we are in the uh, sliding mode, uh, this equation should be satisfied. 
And this is first order differential equation. When we solve uh, for the uh, uh, X one, uh, its solution is uh, first order uh, it's exponential with uh, uh, negative C one, which converges to zero. So this is uh, all about uh, sliding mode control uh, as simple as possible. But here uh, there is also one uh, important point I would like to uh, share. Um, in this system, in this uh, equation, th there is no parameter. There is no uh, L, there is no C, there is no R. So it doesn't depend on uh, circuit parameters. Uh, how do we design a sliding mode control? Uh, as I said, uh, we have to uh, select uh, sliding surface function. Uh, the, it could be uh, by combining uh, system states, by multiplying each uh, state by a suitable gain. Here, uh, they are represented by lambda, okay? This is first uh, possibility. Second possibility is to have only two uh, state variables, uh, x1 uh, here, lambda two should be uh, x2. There is a small mistake here. Or it could be just based on uh, just one state. Of course, how can we uh, select the sliding surface? It depends on uh, the system that you want to control. And the selection of coefficients, uh, I'm talking about uh, lambda one, lambda two, uh, and so on. Uh, in the case of a linear case where we have uh, more than two lambdas, uh, it is quite difficult uh, to select these gains. Uh, in the case of a uh, second uh, case, uh, we have only uh, one uh, lambda, uh, so the, its selection is uh, uh, simple. And uh, the third choice is uh, where we have a nonlinear uh, surface. Uh, here we have x to the power gamma, where gamma is uh, between zero and one. Therefore, it makes this system uh, nonlinear. And in the last one, uh, there is no gain. Uh, uh, I would now, uh, point out here that when we have nonlinear sliding surface, uh, we have uh, the, the other variant of sliding mode control, which is called terminal sliding mode control or non-singular terminal sliding mode control. Uh, regarding PWM generation uh, methods, uh, we can use uh, high stresses band or we can use uh, standard triangular carrier. When we use high stresses band, uh, we uh, want to uh, uh, mitigate uh, the chattering, uh, but uh, this is not uh, completely possible uh, and it yields to uh, time varying switching frequency. The reason is uh, using high stresses band is because of this uh, uh, sine function. Okay, so when we implement a uh, sine function, uh, the switching frequency becomes uh, uncontrollable. Therefore, uh, instead of uh, uh, avoid chattering, we implement uh, the uh, sine function in practice using high stresses band, where we have a small high stresses band uh, such that uh, these uh, zigzag movements uh, are um, uh, are controlled. Uh, so we can have uh, the sliding line uh, where we have a fixed slope. And as you can see here, we have a blue one uh, is our uh, sliding line and the uh, black uh, lines uh, indicate uh, the high stresses band and the red ones are the state trajectories. So uh, generally speaking, uh, in sliding mode, we have uh, two uh, phases. The uh, first one is reaching phase, and the second one is sliding phase. So when the system uh, is not in the sliding mode, 
First, uh, it should uh, reach to the uh, uh, sliding mode. It should hit uh, to this sliding line. And if your sliding mode uh, uh, exists, then uh, your state trajectory makes uh, such zigzag movements and uh, converges to the origin. And in the origin, we have uh, x1 and x2, which are both zero. So this is when we have a uh, fixed slope. On the other hand, uh, it is possible to uh, change the slope. So if you uh, give a large uh, lambda, then a slope will change. And what happens when a slope changes? Uh, the dynamic response becomes better. Uh, I have mentioned about uh, chattering reduction methods. Uh, one of them is using high stresses function. So it could be using single high stresses, double high stresses, or I know in practice, in literature, there are uh, more than double, uh, there are techniques which use uh, more than uh, double bond high stresses. So the idea is to uh, mitigate the uh, chattering. The second technique is uh, using boundary layer. Again, uh, here uh, we can uh, pass uh, the sliding surface function through a boundary layer. And in this case, uh, the uh, sliding surface can be easily uh, compared with the triangular uh, to produce PWM uh, signals. In this case, uh, the switching frequency is fixed, uh, easy implementation. However, uh, there will be some steady state error because of the uh, value of the uh, boundary layer. Uh, in the case of high stresses function, uh, okay, it is easy to implement. However, uh, time uh, varying switching frequency uh, exists, and also there are some uh, steady state errors. Uh, the other technique uh, to reduce chattering is possible uh, by using state observers. Uh, this is also uh, uh, gives flexibility. However, it is um, uh, complicated. It increases the implementation complexity. And also, it requires uh, more effort in the controller design. And uh, super twisting uh, algorithm is also uh, popular. It has been recently applied in power converters. So this technique is also uh, used to uh, reduce chattering. Uh, it is uh, uh, easy to implement. Uh, switching frequency is fixed. Uh, however, uh, uh, the theoretical proof of the finite convergence and stability uh, are not uh, uh, studied yet. Uh, I can show you some uh, simulation and theoretical results regarding uh, double bond uh, high stresses technique, which is taken from this paper. Uh, as you can see, uh, the, the uh, switching frequency, uh, the uh, red one is simulation and blue one is the theoretical. So it is changing uh, the, by time uh, because of the uh, nature of the uh, sliding mode control. And as I said uh, in the previous slide, uh, once you design uh, sliding mode control, you have to uh, ensure that it exists. And the uh, existence condition can be uh, tested uh, by uh, this equation, where the sigma and sigma dot, uh, their multiplication should be always less than zero. If you achieve this, then you can say that your sliding mode exists. And uh, I think I have mentioned uh, about a sliding function, uh, which is not uh, sensitive to the system parameters. And in this case, uh, the sliding uh, mode control is robust. Uh, 
to the uh, parameters. Uh, also, uh, there is uh, existence uh, of the sliding mode and uh, stability region. Uh, of course, uh, uh, you have to uh, look at the papers uh, to understand how these uh, regions are uh, obtained. Uh, however, uh, I would like to point out that when you change uh, lambda, lambda is our um, sliding gain, sliding coefficient. By changing lambda, you are changing the stability region. So uh, these uh, curves show you that uh, when you increase lambda, uh, you can make the uh, dynamic response faster. However, uh, you reduce the uh, stability region. So first of all, uh, uh, in order to have successful uh, sliding mode control design, then you have to ensure that uh, the, the system trajectory uh, hits between these points S1 and S2. In this case, you can say that uh, sliding mode exists. Uh, and as I said, uh, the size of the stability region uh, may change uh, depending on the value of uh, lambda. When large lambda is used, uh, the, the dynamic response becomes faster. When you use small lambda, uh, you slow down the dynamic response. Okay, now uh, I know I am uh, maybe running on out of time, but uh, I think I will be able to complete it on time. Let us uh, have a look at some applications for the CDC converter. Here we have the uh, general block diagram and uh, we have uh, experimental result when we have a small lambda. And uh, on the right hand side, uh, we have uh, the result obtained by large lambda, and this is for uh, a DC DC pack uh, converter. Again, uh, if we look at uh, the uh, state trajectory for a small lambda, as you can see, the trajectory takes some time to reach the origin. Uh, on the left, we have simulation. On the right, we have uh, experimental. And uh, when we have large lambda, as you can see, uh, uh, the state trajectory starts at point P1. Uh, this is reaching phase. It reaches to uh, sliding line at point P2 and uh, makes uh, zigzag movements to reach point three. And uh, here is the uh, experimental result for this case. And uh, another uh, application for uh, DC to AC converter. Uh, again, uh, we can uh, you can see the general block diagram, and on the right hand side we can see uh, the application which is for grid connected inverter with LCL filter. Uh, for single phase uh, application. Uh, we can see that uh, in the experimental result, the, the grid current is quite fast. Uh, so this is uh, one of the objective. Uh, the spectrum of the grid current is uh, very nice. We have only fundamental, almost no harmonics. And also uh, when you uh, have LCL filter, we have resonance issue of the LCL filter. And in most uh, of the cases, we have uh, resonance dumping. And luckily here, uh, the sliding mode control can handle this uh, resonance issue very easily. And if you look at the uh, block diagram here, uh, we have used only uh, L2. Uh, to generate uh, capacitor voltage reference. Other than that, no mathematical uh, model is needed. Okay, UPS inverter, again, a single phase. Uh, this um, technique here uses uh, time varying uh, coefficient. So blue one here is fixed sliding line. 
and the red one is obtained by uh, by the method introduced in this paper where we change uh, the uh, uh, sliding coefficient uh, uh, online uh, by using some fuzzy logic uh, approaches mentioned in this paper. And it has been applied to uh, triad load and uh, rectifier load cases and uh, very fast uh, dynamic response, robustness, easy implementation uh, are achieved. Uh, another application, uh, again, uh, could connect an inverter with uh, LCL filter, but this is a uh, three phase. Uh, very fast uh, dynamic response uh, is also obtained, uh, as can be seen uh, from the experimental results. Uh, and also in the second uh, result, uh, you can see that uh, the, the grid current is uh, sinusoidal, uh, very uh, with very uh, reasonable THD under uh, distorted uh, grid voltages as well. And again, if you look at the uh, model of the uh, uh, sliding control, here there is nothing uh, related with the system model. We have just uh, a PR controller here, proportional resonant control to generate reference capacitor current. And here we have uh, uh, the X1, which is capacitor voltage difference, and it's derivative. That's it. And fourth uh, application is uh, dynamic voltage restorer uh, for single phase application. Uh, the, this paper, uh, the details are shown here. Uh, it has uh, uh, important uh, finding such that uh, the lambda uh, is determined mathematically. So in the previous applications, lambda uh, was uh, based on, uh, was selected by trial and error. However, here we have shown that it can be uh, computed mathematically such that uh, if you increase it, uh, the uh, this stability or existence region uh, will not be affected. Uh, ACDC converter, uh, another application uh, for uh, three level, uh, three phase uh, uh, T type uh, rectifier. Again, uh, we have used sliding mode control to uh, uh, achieve the desired control. Here uh, we have the sliding surface, which is based on uh, current error only. Unlike the uh, previous uh, examples, we have no gain here. Uh, so, uh, as you can see from the results, steady state as well as dynamics, uh, we have fast uh, dynamic response, we have robustness as it does not depend on circuit parameters and easy implementation. Uh, so, uh, after these uh, the examples, uh, we can say that uh, sliding mode control uh, does not need mathematical model of the converter uh, to be controlled. Uh, it is uh, not sensitive uh, to the system parameters. Uh, and as you know, these um, the parameters uh, are changing due to the aging and operating conditions such as temperature and so on. Uh, it has a very fast dynamic response uh, and, in, and also it has very uh, easy uh, implementation. Uh, on the other hand, it has uh, some disadvantages. Uh, one of them is the, the chattering. And this is the uh, reason why uh, many people, uh, when they hear word uh, sliding mode control, they say that this is not good. Uh, it has chattering, but uh, as I said, there are uh, many techniques available in the literature to reduce effect of chattering. However, uh, uh, last uh, the important uh, point, uh, as I said at my uh, uh, at the beginning, uh, these techniques are valid in continuous time. But when we implement uh, these techniques, we implement it in discrete time. Therefore, uh, in order to have uh, 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 
successful design, your sampling time should be small. If you have uh, sampling time large, then uh, even uh, everything is designed perfect in continuous time. It may not work in discrete time. Therefore, we need a discrete time sliding mode control techniques. Uh, and this is one of the open uh, areas in this uh, control method. Uh, I think uh, I have completed. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, you can send my uh, email he shown here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Komuchugil, for your presentation. Actually, you answered one of the questions regarding uh, digital implementation, that it is still pending in the literature and still some development has to be done. Uh, another thing that I think is important, there is one question asking uh, how to select an optimum sliding surface. Well, it depends on uh, this system, actually, uh, second order system, third order system. There is no specific answer uh, to this question. But if you are going to make a terminal sliding mode, non-singular terminal sliding mode, definitely the sliding surface should be non-linear. But other converter topologies, it depends on what you want to control. OK, so there is no, there is no more single answer for that. No. OK, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. I see that Professor Rodriguez has joined us, so we will. Yeah, switch. I am here. Can you listen to me? Yes, Jose, we can hear you. Hassan, could you stop sharing your screen so Jose can start sharing his? Very nice presentation, Hassan. I will communicate with you in the future. Okay, so Jose, the floor is yours. Please proceed with your presentation. Yeah, thank you. Now I will. Let me see here. Yeah. Also, I think all our attendees grateful for you joining because it's only 8 a.m. in Chile. So you have been early um, only for us. Let me check here. This is um, I'm founding. Can you see my my presentation? No. We can yet. see a video, but not presentation, not yet. Uh, let me check. Uh, did you allow me to share my screen? Yes, you should be. Yes, you should. You, you should be able to. We are using Zoom. Yeah. Yes. Oh 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 oh. Let me see. Let me see. And I don't find here uh, the possibility. Participant right on this record to the cloud chat. Oh, I don't find. Uh, I'm really hurt. I can. Let me check here. Wait, 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 wait. Now, yeah. share screen here. Now I found it. Great. Because you're co host, you should be. Yes, now we can see your screen. Ah, okay. I have a 25, 30 minutes time. Yes, we, we, we have a little bit of flexibility. I added some buffer. Okay. Okay. I will go straight uh, to my presentation. Thank you very much for this invitation. It is this truly international talk, Andre. It is my pleasure to, to introduce to you um, uh, a, a new control strategy that is having increasing attention in power electronics and drives. This is called predictive control. Um, and here, if you allow me. Here, uh, in general, uh, the why is predictive control attractive? Uh, it has some advantages. It, um, it is simple to understand and it is simple to implement. Jose, uh, could you could you go to the full screen mode of the screen? Uh, let me see. I, 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 
uh, I don't find here. Where should I go to the full screen? Try, try F11 for chance. Uh, F11? Yes, many softwares will help with that. No, okay. But can you see that in this case? Because I don't find a way to increase my to full screen. Okay, yeah, we can continue yeah. with this too. Yeah, uh, and look, um, using positive control, um, you can uh, control uh, very easily several different variables. And what is very important for power electronics, you can very easily include nonlinearity and power converters are nonlinear system because they are composite but switches that do not work, do not work in active mode, but on off. And uh, as I said, the controller is very easy to implement using microprocessors. Uh, this disadvantages of this strategy uh, is the very large amount of calculation you need to do online uh, in comparison to classic controllers. And of course, the quality of the model uh, has a strong influence in the behavior of the control system. Now, let, let's see how the, this strategy works. First, in the first part of my presentation, I have three goals. I want to show you first that predictive control is different to linear control with PWM. Second, that predictive control is simple. And third, that it works. Only that. That is my goal in this presentation. How does it work? Okay, excuse me. Try, try pressing Control L. This was suggested by participants. Control L. Yes. Wow. Excellent. Good, good. Thank you, thank you, thank please, you. Yeah, please proceed. Thank you. Uh, how does uh, predictive control work? First, uh, the converter is modeled as a system with fin states. Um, in, in this is, these are the voltage vectors generated by a three level voltage source inverter, six active voltage vector and two zero voltage vectors. And a model for the low is used, I will come back to this equation, to predict the behavior or the variable in the next sampling time. In this case, we have the, the, the current and we predict the, the behavior of the current. I will go back to this equation um, in one moment. And then the control action, the control function, what we call the cost function, defines the represent that what you want to do in, in, in your control strategy. In this case, if you want to do the current control, you minimize the error of the reference cursor, the reference current I star, uh, with the predicted current, IP, and you select the switching state that minimizes this error and you apply that switching state in the next sample interval in, in the inverter. And that's all. <clears throat> and you don't need any uh, linear controller and a, 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 any pulse width modulator. The, the question is, the fundamental question is, <clears throat> how do we predict the behavior of a variable in, 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 in our filling power electronics? And uh, I selected the very uh, the simplest element, which is an inductance here. Do you see the hand? My hand here. Yeah. Here, uh, the, the the basic equation of this fundamental component is the voltage is the inductance multiplied by the IDT. If you write this equation in a discrete form using the Euler discretization, uh, this equation turns into equation two here. And then if from this equation, you obtain this expression, which is very simple to understand. And this is a key equation. Look, what does this equation say? I am able to predict the behavior or the value of current in the sample interval K plus one. If I know, if I measure the value of the current in the sample interval K for all different voltage vectors, that are applied to the inductance. This is the, the main important uh, thing. Um, the, this is the fundamental of the strategy. Let's go then with this um, basic idea. Let's go to, to do the uh, current control of the three phase two level voltage source inverter. Here you have the, uh, the switching states yeah, for phase A, B, and C. Here you have the, the definition of the voltage vectors of the vectors. And here are the seven different voltage vectors generated by this inverter. You learn that, that in, in, in basic power electronics course. In this, in here we have the vector equation of the three phase load. 
Here you have the definition of the voltage vector, the current um, vector, and the AMK vector. This is an active um, three phase load. And then if you consider this oil approximation for the IDT and you replace this approximated equation into this differential equation, you get this expression. And this expression tells you that you are able to predict the behavior of the value of or the value of the load current in the sample interval k plus one if you measure the value of the current in sample interval k and you are able to predict the behavior of this current for all different voltage vectors generated by the inverter in this case six active vector vectors and two zero vectors and that's all and with this equation you go to this uh, block diagram for the control. Here you have the reference current. Here you have the power inverter, the load. You measure the value of the current in the sample interval K. And you use the model to predict the behavior of the current. Which model? This equation here. And then for, uh, and you calculate for all different voltage vectors, which are seven values, you predict the value of the uh, load current, which will be, would be the value of the current for all different voltage vectors. And then here you minimize, uh, the, the, you, calcul you calculate the cost function, the error between these predicted values of the current with the reference. And you select the switching state that minimizes the error and you deliver direct the gate type pulses to the power transistors. And that's all and you, you don't need any additional controller or PWM. Let's see graphically how does it work. We have for every, for let's start with voltage vector V0 and you calculate the error between the predicted current and the reference current and that gives you a, a certain value, 0 0.6. Then you, you, in your microprocessor, you repeat the calculation uh, 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 for the voltage vector one that gives you another um, uh, value for the cost function. And you repeat in your microprocessor all the calculations for all different voltage vectors. And you select the one um, switching state that minimizes the error, in this case, in this case, this one. And you deliver voltage vector V2 to the load. And here you can have, I can show you some simulation results. Here is the load current. IA, the voltage uh, uh, de delivered by the inverter. This is terminal A uh, with respect to the neutral point of the load. And, and, and you can recognize here the pulsing um, the behavior typical for a PWM inverter. And here you increase the switching frequency and you observe also the uh, voltage in, in the load. Let's compare uh, the behavior of predictive control at the left side with linear control and PWM at the right side. Here, starting from zero in PWM, let's first, um, here we have current I alpha and I alpha start the reference. Here come the reference back to perfect sinusoid. And you see that current I alpha moves very fast to reach the reference here. And uh, a look at current I beta uh, for moves very fast to reach the reference. Here you can observe a small overshoot, but at the end the, the current reaches the reference. And here we introduce a step change in, in current I alpha. We reduce the amplitude significantly to this point. And you can observe here that the value, the real value of current I alpha reaches the references. What you cannot avoid is a cross coupling typical in this kind of control systems that uh, although we don't have any change in the reference current I beta, there is a small deviation of the real current I beta. Let's move to predictive control. You see uh, a similar behavior here. The current has a, a, a very similar uh, performance like PWM. And here when you change the, uh, but lo look at here, the in current I beta moves very fast without overshoot and reaches the reference. And here, when you change the amplitude of current I alpha, uh, the current moves very fast also, 
but the cross coupling uh, with current uh, I beta is much smaller than in the case of linear control with QWM. Here, the, the, uh, at the beginning, when I started working in this area, the question is, is it possible to do all the calculations you need uh, to do? Because you need to do these seven calculations in the ripple of the current. And that is extremely fast. And the, the question was, is it possible to do this calculation with a regular existing commercial microprocessors? And that was a digital signal from um, a DSP from te Texas uh, some years ago. And, and it is possible to, to do that online. Let's do a comparison with cl classical control linear. Uh, by the way, um, I hope you are clear. This is the dominant uh, current con or, or control technique in power electronic is the classical linear control with PWM, pulse width modulator or space vector modulator, if you like. And uh, um, uh, let's compare from a conceptual, conceptual point of view, current control with predictive control. The, the block diagrams of both, um, let's say, look different. And in both cases, you have the, the similar model for the inverter, which is expressed as a, um, a figure with voltage, different voltage vectors. And then uh, in both cases, you have the same equation for the low here. This is the general equation here. Is this, this is the same equation. Uh, this one, but expresses in the discrete form. Uh, by the way, you must know that today the only way to do linear control, a P, this is a PI controller, is to do it in microprocessor. That means you must use this equation also in a discrete way. And third, here you have to calculate the parameters for the uh, controller, the, the proportional gain, the integral time that you, you must design this controller and comparable to this function in the classical control is the what I call here the selection, uh, this iteration to, to select uh, the, um, um, to minimize the cost function. And as a, as a last step, and here, when you select the um, optimal switching state, you deliver to the load and you, do, you did nothing additional to do. And here, uh, you need, in addition to this, to the calculation, calculation of the controller, you need to develop your modulator. And that's it. Okay. And, and these are the, uh, the, the conclusion of this part of my presentation is that um, predictive control is, from the concept, is different to PWM. We don't need to linearize here, nothing. Uh, the, 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 the main feature of predictive control that you work with instantaneous values. And, and, and if you do classical linear control, you, you must uh, um, uh, linearize and, and, you, uh, and, and, and you work with mean values. And uh, I think, I hope I show you that um, predictive control is very simple to understand and to implement. And um, um, it has a very, let's say, very good performance, very decent performance. I am not saying that it is better than linear control because for that, I, I need more time for a presentation to go deep into the comparison. Just, uh, I want to say that it is different, it is simple, that, and, that, and it works. And very important, it can be implemented with standard microprocessors. That means it is realistic. But I, I, I presented to you, was published in 2007. Uh, this first part of my presentation uh, was included in this paper. And in that year, um, this paper was awarded the base paper of the year in the transaction industrial electronic, what uh, I, I am very proud of. Then as a next step, uh, increasing the, the complication, I, 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 I will show you how to control uh, the uh, an active front end. Uh, this is a a PWM rectifier here. This is a rectifier that works with power transistors. And um, uh, uh, now the, the, uh, in the inverter, the power flows from the DC link, from the DC power supply to the AC load. Now in the PWM rectifier, the energy flows from the AC line to the DC load. 
in this case, let's say a resistor. And in, in to do that, you can control this uh, converter with this cost function. You control the re instantaneous reactive power and the instantaneous active power. And how do you calculate uh, using the instantaneous um, power, uh, reactive power uh, theory of Akagi? Uh, you calculate this uh, uh, instantaneous power uh, uh, according to this equation. This is the real part of the voltage multiplied by the um, uh, conjugate of the current in this equation and the reactive power with this equation. And uh, um, how uh, do you um, obtain the value in the sample interval k plus one? It is very easy because if you measure the, 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 the voltage source in the sample interval k, um, the voltage source, the sinusoidal, changes very, very slowly in relation to the switching frequency. So you can consider that both values are equal. And then you need to predict only the behavior of the um, input current. But the, the behavior of the input current is predicted exactly with the same equation I mentioned to you at the very beginning of my presentation, where in this case, the, um, the acting variable, the, the voltage for the control is the voltage generated by, by the active front end, which is generated in this point. And here with this equation, for all different voltage vectors that are seven uh, voltage vectors generated by the active front end at this point, you predict which will be the behavior of the input current generated by the three-phase line. And with this value, you are generated, uh, able to predict the value of the reactive power on the, the active power. Mm -hmm. And to have sinusoidal operation with power factor one, you give us a reference reactive power uh, uh, zero. And this is very important because the active power that um, is delivered by the three-phase source goes to the load in one part and to control the voltage of the DC link capacitor here. Uh, and, and that's a, uh, um, and that's the reason why we obtain here this value. The, the, the main figure, the, the main figure of merit to, to control this rectifier is the value of the DC uh, voltage. Because if, if the DC voltage is decreasing, the voltage in the capacitor is going down. That means the load is demanding um, much power. And that means as a reaction, the power supply, the three phase power supply must deliver more active power to load the, the capacitor. And that's the reason why we, we have this here. And here you can observe the control of the active power, reactive power, the input current, and the input voltage. You can observe that the uh, current and the voltage are in phase. So, so here, uh, it is what I mentioned to you. If you decrease the value of the resistance in the DC link, that means you are demanding more power, active power uh, at the output of the re this rectifier. You don't, you, you must keep the reactive power uh, zero to operate always with power factor one. And if you increase the, 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 the load at the output, that means the capacitor voltage will, voltage will decrease and that uh, the control system will react increasing the input current to maintain this voltage constant. The, uh, uh, I wanted to go to this topology because if you can't control this topology, in my opinion, after controlling this, you can later control anything you want. And, and here is a, a generalized frequency changer. You have one network here, a three phase, let's say power supply, and you, ha you have here another three phase system. This can be an AC machine. That's uh, 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 this topology. Is um, uh, a four quadrant um, power converter that allows the power flow in both directions between the, the 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 power supply and the load. In this case, in this case, maybe and as I say, as I said, a three phase AC machine. And here you have to uh, um, you can control everything with just one single cost function. But my recommendation is to use two separate cost functions: one for the inverter. And one for the rectifier. 
from the inverter, we have exactly the same contour strategy I present in the initial part of my presentation. And for the rectify, you have exactly the same part, uh, what I mentioned previously, previously for the control of the PWM rectifier. And here you have the block diagram for the complete control system. Here you recognize to control the inverter that supplies the load. You have just the current control, and if you want to do current control, you have this very simple equation. And here, uh, with this uh, load current, you uh, you can estimate the the power, the active power you you need to deliver to the load. And if you remember in, in my in my previous, uh, I will go back. Here, here I had a PI controller. So what I, I, I am presented here is a mixture between classical linear control and um, predictive control. What I have here, I replaced the PI controller for just the very, very simple equation uh, 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 in order to observe the behavior of the capacitor voltage. And here, uh, the active power at the input side of this converter must deliver the active power to the load and to control the DC link. And that's the reason why I, I add the power to the load and the power to the DC link. And this is the active power that must be delivered by the power supply. And here I have the model of the current. I, I do the prediction. And here I have a minimization uh, a cost function for, for this. Um, the, the system, the strategy is so, so flexible that I can add these two cost functions in just one single cost function and minimize one function. I do that separately because uh, here I need to control this uh, active front end, I need um, seven switching states. And if I control separately this uh, other inverter, I have another seven calculation that is seven plus seven is 14. If I use one a single cost function, but it is possible and it works, believe me, it works, I tried it. The problem is you have seven uh, different uh, switching states here and seven different vectors. You need seven multiplied by seven, 49 calculations to optimize this, uh, the, 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 the best switching state. And it is not wise because we don't have time to do very um, much calculation. Look some results here. We increased uh, here. What we did, we we increase uh, a step change in the load current. And when the load current in increases, this is the voltage of the load. Uh, that means in uh, at the very beginning, you demand more power from the DC link, and uh, the DC link reacts, reducing the DC link voltage. And, as a, uh, and, and to compensate, to avoid this reduction, the input part of the active front end reacts increasing the input current. And you observe that the system keeps the control and generates a very good sinusoidal current without any modulator or without linear controller. Let's move a step forward. And here I will show you an, an NPC neutral point clamp in, uh, inverter, which is a three level uh, inverter. And here, uh, the feature is we have more uh, switching state, more vectors. And uh, the, the control linear control scheme is the same here, but the, the, the pulse width modulation or the space vector modulation is more sophisticated, but it is a standard commercial industrial product. It is solved that problem. And uh, we can, uh, uh, using predictive control, we have, we have the same uh, procedure. Um, instead of the seven voltage, different voltage vector, we are here at 27, much more voltage vectors. With an additional, um, let's say, restriction. In this case, uh, these two capacitors, we must have the same value uh, in voltage. So we, we must predict the voltage for every switching state, uh, which is the behavior of the capacitor voltages. And uh, here, important, how to predict the behavior of the capacitor voltages. Uh, uh, here, again, you go back to the very basic equation, instant voltage equation of the capacitor. And with this uh, equation, you can predict the value of the capacitor voltage in circuit type K plus one. If you have, if you know the, the voltage in something 
time interval k for all different uh, currents that um, flow through the capacitor. And the cost function here is the error, uh, error cost and additional uh, control action that I will explain immediately now. With this part of the cost function, you control the, the quality of the current. And here, with this uh, other term, you um, uh, keep balance, you, you calculate the error between the two capacitor voltages and you minimize the error. And, and to do that, you add to this current uh, action, current control action, this term using what I call a weighting factor lambda. If you put lambda DC equals zero, that means you are not taking into consideration the balance of the, of the capacitor voltages. And if you increase the, this uh, value of lambda of the weighting factor, that means you give more weight, more importance to the action of keep the, the capacitor balanced. But you will have a cost that the, the control of the current loses importance and you will uh, face a deterioration in the quality of the control. So you must find a compromise. And here you have an additional term, which is NC is the number of commutations that is related to the switching frequency. If you uh, increase the value of this weighting factor, that means it is more important to minimize the number of commutation, that is you will reduce the switching frequency. Let's see how it works. Here you have for comparison PWM, and um, predictive control for a switching frequency of 700 Hz. What for uh, an NPC, three-level NPC, but it's quite high, quite high for a fundamental frequency of 50 Hz. So uh, this is more realistic. Uh, in, in increasing the, 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 the weighting factor lambda n, uh, compare this is the, uh, uh, the value of lambda m here, and here you have a much higher value, and you observe a reduction in the, in, uh, in, in the switching frequency, which is quite comparable to what you can reach with PWM. And here, as I told you, if you have um, uh, lambda DC equal to zero, you lose um, um, control in the, in the balance of the capacitor voltages, and the system operates quite well. In order to um, let's say, give you um, an indication of the flexibility uh, of predictive control. I, I want to show you, um, let me, I will jump this. I will go directly to predictive token control in benefit of time. Here, uh, 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 it is not uh, possible to control current and voltage, but you can also control any variable you want. If you have an equation to model it, you can uh, uh, control it. Look here, uh, for the control of an induction machine, um, the torque equation, which is the fundamental equation, is this one here. It's the flux in the current. And uh, uh, we came to the idea, uh, what about to control the torque uh, and the flux in an induction machine? And here you have the, the, the classical speed control, API control, and here you have the reference torque and the reference flux. So uh, 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 we develop a switching fu uh, a cost function that minimizes the error in the torque. This is reference torque, electric torque. This is predicted torque. And this is here uh, the reference state of flux. And this is predicted state of flux. This is the weighting factor here. Where do the reference value come from here from the speed control system. And here you give a reference of the state of flux. The question is how can you predict the value of the torque and of the flux? Uh, and it, it, look, you can predict the value of the state of flux coming from the very basic state of voltage equation of the machine. The fundamental equation, which is the simplest equation you find in any control, in any book of electrical machine, you use that equation without neglecting anything to obtain this equation. And this is the equation for the prediction of a flux. 
And for the prediction of, of carbon, um, using some mathematics, which is not complicated, you obtain this equation. And look, if this equation tells you the following, if you measure the state of current in sampling interval K, you are able to predict the behavior of the state of current in the sampling interval K plus one for all different voltage vectors generated by the inverter, that is, and if, if we, are, we are able to predict the state of flux in the current, we are able to predict the torque. And with that, you have all the system you need. And here you have some, uh, the reference speed, the speed, the torque, the flux, and the current in the machine. I, I will jump this because I didn't discuss uh, the direct torque control. This is very interesting. Um, uh, Andy, please tell me how many minutes do I have? Actually, we need to start concluding. Maybe we will skip the matrix. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, then I, 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 I will move to, to the end. <laughs> this, is, this is a very local uh, um, Yeah, It is a complicated converter to control. Yeah. The, uh, this is my 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 my, my, my last uh, slide, uh, gentlemen. Uh, why, in my opinion, is predictive control so suitable for power electronics? Look, the power com uh, uh, first because the power converter, the plant, the system you want to control, is a, it has a discrete nature in power electronics because uh, 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 look. Uh, uh, if you have an, uh, any converter, the converter it is discrete. Switches are open and closed. And if you look at the the, uh, 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 the system in general, it is a discrete system. And then uh, 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 that means the the system to be controlled is discrete. And on the other hand, the controller you use to do the control action is also discrete. The microprocessor. So modern predictive control adapts in a very natural and direct way um, the discrete form of the plant to be controlled and of the controller. The, it is not necessary to, 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 to go the long way of being starting linearizing the system. That is the main uh, uh, feature, the main reason why in my opinion predictive control is, uh, will be so strong in the future in power electronics. And with the ah, and, 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 and my and my students if, when uh, in, in a graduate course when I teach them um, uh, power electronics uh, and, and they say professor uh, you are you have uh, you are joking or you are you are being playing with us because we spend so much time I, I learning linear control PWN and everything and, and we can do uh, everything using MPC. And why we do we, we have to spend my, uh, so much time in the other uh, strategy? And my answer is always uh, because in the industry you will find linear control and push width modulation. This is something new that will be the future. But now you must go to the industry now, so that means you must learn both. And with that, I end my presentation, Andre. Uh, thank you, Jose. Very insightful presentation. Could you maybe um, comment a little bit? There have been a number of questions regarding the main drawbacks of MPC. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, when, well, uh, the, the, the main drawbacks uh, uh, or limitations, uh, the main problem is um, uh, what I, I very fast uh, show you uh, as the, the weighting factor. Uh, the calculation is the weighting factor well, has been one of the most attractive uh, research uh, subjects in in the last uh, in the last ten years, because it it, 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 it it is not it is not like in classical linear control theory where you, you know exactly how do you have to calculate uh, the gain of the PI controller or the integration time. You, the, the rules are very precise, and we engineer like to have this uh, very clear equation how to do it. Uh, here at the beginning, the weighting factor was calculated just running simulation and look which is look better. Okay, that is my, my selection. But uh, we engineers don't like this, uh, let's say so called heuristic approach 
we, we, we like precise action equations. So uh, that one of the uh, intense at the beginning was a drawback, but now uh, there the, the, uh, the are some uh, strategies to, to solve that. Uh, in, in one of my favorite papers in the last time has, has been how to do predictive control without weighting factor, uh, which is also very, very interesting. That is one thing. And the other thing is, is, is that uh, the main question is that model predict control, the quality of the control depends on the quality of the model. And um, of course, and uh, that is a, 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 this a problem has been a subject of intense research. And now I, I am working with a new trend, which is called model free predictive control. Uh, and, and that is very, uh, very interesting and very robust. And, but uh, it is a long uh, work to be done still. These are, my, in my opinion, the most important features, um, Andre, in my opinion. Yes, thank you, Jose. That's very interesting insight from your side. So as you're running- and Congratulations for organizing this, Andre, because I really enjoyed the, the presentation of slide remotes. I, I will have to contact this professor. Yeah, yeah, of course, I will get you in touch. And uh, of course, uh, thanks a lot to you for joining in early morning because uh, yeah, we have uh, still uh, over a hundred participants with us. So. Wow, wow, it is an honor. It is an honor to be part of an international audience, Andre, really. I think you can expect a lot of emails, you know, <laughs> to, to <them. laughs> yeah, please, please give my give to them my emails. I will- yeah, but you're in the public. So Professor Rodriguez is a professor with Universidad de Andres Bello in Chile, so unab.cl. So if you use his unab email, uh, he will respond. If you have some uh, interesting question, uh, yeah. Oh, cooperation, I will be very yeah. happy to that. Oh, 165, I didn't expect, I, I was expecting five, 10 people suddenly. We wow. have 105 actually, so we are dropping slowly. People 165, oh yeah, it is, a, it is a honor, okay? So Jose, but, please stop sharing your screen and I will switch to sharing my presentation. Yeah, thanks a lot. So dear participants, now I will start sharing my screen here. Uh, can you see my screen, my presentation? Can Jose or Gianpaolo can comment anyone? Yes, we can. Oh, thanks a lot. So uh, this is the last presentation for today in this webinar series. And I will be talking for to, uh, about the topology morphing control for isolated DC-DC converters, because uh, this is where this control type makes most of the sense. So when we are talking about uh, the isolated DC-DC converters, and right now most of my research and many publications are coming from the field of uh, uh, high step up DC DC converters. We can say that uh, high step up is uh, quite promising applications for many emerging, uh, quite promising solution for many emerging applications. However, when we see a typical galvanically isolated DC DC converter, we can structurally split it into three main blocks. First block is a boost inverter. Uh, first of all, so yeah, here. Boost inverter. So, and uh, each of these converter stages could be considered as having a certain gain. For example, boost inverter has a DC AC gain, uh, which I defined as a ratio between peak to peak voltage applied to the transformer uh, in relation to the input voltage. So, meaning for full for full bridge converter, we can have this gain too because we have two times higher voltage swings in the input. Uh, voltage applied to the inverter stage. Then of course, step up transformer. So typically this is a turn to ratio. However, there are several concepts showing uh, co converters with stopped winding when you can have several different turn to ratios depending on the switch uh, configurating, configurating the output of the transformer. Moreover, there are several concepts the exp explaining the uh, several transformers in high step up converters that where one of them could be bypassed uh, and excluded from the circuit when high step up is not needed. 
And of course, at the output, we have a rectifier because after the step up transformer has matched the voltage level, we need to rectify the high frequency AC voltage into the DC voltage that could fit our DC load or DC microgrid. So this could be reconfigurable or multi-mode. And actually there is a high number of different examples for that. So uh, regarding topology morphing control, what does it mean? Topology morphing control, basically this is reconfiguration in any of this stage or in all of them. So well, how can we do, use it? We can extend the input voltage regulation range. What, why would we need it? We, we could need it for photovoltaic system where global maximum power point tracking, GMPPT is needed, or in systems of building integrated PV, BIPV. Uh, this is where uh, we have a lot of variability in shapes and sizes of PV modules. So the, the demand for voltage regulation could be really wide depending on application, as well as small wind turbines. There are examples with permanent magnet synchronous generator based small wind turbines where the voltage range could be one to five. Of course, the other application is extension of the output voltage regulation range. One possibility is, uh, of course, uh, electric vehicle charging. We know that right now on the market, we have a huge amount of different models of electrical vehicles. Some of them are charged with 200 volts, some of them with 400 volts, some of them with 800 volts. So reconfiguring your converter, you can possibly change the output voltage and adopt to the needs of your application or to the needs of particular vehicle. Uh, what does it mean uh, fault tolerant converter operation? So uh, as I told that, topology morphing control could extend your regulation range, but you can see this in terms, it could add new uh, operating modes to your converter, meaning that if some switch or some device in your circuit fails in your topology, you can continue operating using uh, new operating modes that are uncovered or enabled by the topology morphing control. And uh, the last but not the least example that will be covered today is light load efficiency optimization. This is especially important for renewable energy because, for example, when we are working with photovoltaic or energy harvesting applications, uh, often we are not working at rated power due to shade, due to other condition, temperature changes, and so on. And uh, your efficiency is important not only at the rated power, as, but it's also important at a partial or, or, or light load, where we need actually achieve a good performance still. <coughs> So just a very simple example of topology morphing of the front end inverter. So here you can see voltage fed inverter. So in one of them, there are four transistors that are controlled with PWM. So this is the most typical full bridge inverter and the gain front end inverter gain is two. As I told, this is ratio between peak to peak of output voltage to the input voltage. However, the same topology thanks to having this capacitor C1 could be reconfigured by means of the control to the topology of half bridge. Uh, in this case, of course, the capacitor C1 will operate under certain voltage stress compared to zero average voltage in the full bridge, but we can reduce the voltage swing, this peak-to-peak uh, -peak voltage. Uh, it could be symmetrical or asymmetrical voltage at the output, doesn't really matter. The most important is swing uh, and how it is applied to the transformer. And then your gain is changed twofold compared to the full bridge uh, converter. So yeah, this is this very, very simple example that should, will be more illustrated today. So the, the first uh, several cases will be considered is input voltage regulation range in extension. Uh, a small motivation, as I told that in photovoltaic system, we could need wide input voltage range. Why? Because typical PV module could have several bypass diodes as well, it could suffer from shady condition operation. Uh, so what, what does it mean? It means that your volt ampere characteristic could have several steps, if you see the blue one here. This means in, 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 in reverse that you can have several maximum power point and one of them is local and the other of, the, of them is global maximum power point. And for typical PV modules uh, widely used in industry, which are silicon based monocrystalline PV modules, we see uh, three substrings with three bypass diodes, meaning that your PV module could have six uh, maximum power point uh, op operation regions, let's call them this way. In this case, you need to actually detect where your operation region provides 
the maximum power point at which voltage. And for example, for typical 60 cell PV module, it could be at 30 volt, it could be at 20 volt, it could be at 10 or even eight volts. Really depends on operating conditions regarding shading or dust or snow accumulation on the roof and so on. So that's why we need in, 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 in uh, PV applications, so, uh, meaning PV module level power electronics, MLPE applications, uh, you expect it to provide from eight to 60 volt if you want to ensure global maximum power point tracking. Otherwise it will not be possible to ensure it only operation at first maximum. For example, like in this example, instead of operating in the real maximum. So uh, this is a topology that was developed here in Tallinn together with my colleagues. So we used quasi that source converter. Uh, it is uh, somewhat similar to current FET converters in a way. This is a bug boost converter. And how, how it is controlled, we introduce short through states, meaning when all the transistors here are conducting in order to store energy in quasi that source uh, network. And then we release this energy to the load where, when we have an active state in this inverter. However, uh, what if we need a wider range? Because operating only in this boost mode, when we introduce shoot through, we have certain limit, not only theoretical, but practical limit. When we have excessive losses and we have too much heating in the, too much losses and too much heating of the semiconductor devices, for example, when our duration of shoot through is too long. Too long for quasi that source means you typically over 0 0.3, 0 0.35 for shoot through duty cycle, cumulative one. <clears throat> so what we found is and I, each example has certain digital object identificator at the bottom of the slide. So what we found in 2016 and we published in Transaction Industrial Electronics that this topology could be reconfigured by means of control. How? One of the diagonals could be turned on continuously in order to reduce the uh, gain of the front end inverter. When we reduce the gain, we achieve equivalent back operation because previously we shoot through here, we are boosting and here we are still boosting. But since we are boosting from a lower gain, it's equivalent to the back operation in regards to the full bridge uh, inverter. And you can see here that the modulation is asymmetrical for such a topology. However, it provides you uh, extension to the input voltage regulation range. So let's take a look at some results. So as I told that here we have back mode, normal mode is just a mode where we have a transition from one mode to the other one. So because in the, in this transition is not stationary. Uh, basically this is just for control purposes given in this form. For testing this converter, we developed certain test profile. We, it is shown with this red color. So uh, for this is power red color curve show here, red power profile versus the input voltage, meaning that here is a constant current mode because typically PV module doesn't exceed certain current. Then constant power mode here, we can get maximum power of the converter due to different operating conditions. So this maximum power could appear in this range for typical PV modules. and this range was synthesized uh, based on review of different operating conditions. Long story short is the following that here you can see efficiency, two curves, a purple and red one. So the purple one is for converters that was described with this topology morphing control and for purple, purple curve and the red curve for previously used control. So previously in this topology, the original one, excuse me, here, we haven't been using this modulation with asymmetrical. We haven't, we have been using phase shift modulation to modulate resonant tank because this topology is resonant with low quality factor, Q factor less than one. In such topologies by introducing phase shift modulation, you can achieve voltage step down. However, it suffers from high RMS currents uh, due to low quality factor again, even though it is controlled at a constant switching frequency. So to, to avoid this, uh, the topology morphing control was applied. And you can see that uh, regarding the operation, uh, according to this red power profile, that we have achieved up to 10% efficiency improvement at light load operation at very high step down ratios. Because uh, you see the point of the maximum power, or maximum efficiency. Uh, this is point where our converter is fully so switched. However, of course, when we need to boost or back, we need to introduce some switching losses or some RMS conduction losses or both 
In case of this uh, PSM, red core, uh, we can actually introduce both switching and conduction. But when we switch to the new control method uh, based on topology morphy control, we achieve better results uh, due to switching less switches. Because as you can see here, only two switches are being switched, but also they switched uh, uh, at the same time synchronously, meaning that we can also spread some losses. Another example here is uh, uh, even wider regulating range could be needed for uh, a converter capable of operating with different residential or building integrated PV modules. So this is a recent idea that is, uh, was accepted but is currently in press in one of the IEEE transaction journals from our group in Tallinn that there are so many different types of PV modules proposed for residential applications and they are based on crystalline silicon, copper indium selenite or cadmium telluride technologies. All of these technologies has own voltage ranges and current ranges and there is no converters and co could cover them all. So the idea of this research is was to create a converter one that can fit them all like universalized uh, PV interface for residential applications. And we actually achieved that by using three mode rectifier. So this was developed uh, by me and my colleagues. This is three mode rectifier that could work as a full bridge rectifier, FBR, voltage doubler rectifier, VDR, and voltage quadrupler rectifier, VQR, depending on conditions of these two switches, SR1 and SR2. Uh, so, but based on that, uh, we have built a converter. So you can see that the gain here each time switching from one mode to the other is changing two times. So between the minimum and maximum, there is a fourfold difference. What does it give us? We got the very simple boost hull bridge converter, which is uh, have been proven and justified for PV uh, low power applications and applied a three mode uh, a configurable rectifier to it. So depending on the conditions of these two switches, the output rectifier is either full bridge, voltage doubler or voltage quadrupler. This is a resonant converter, but uh, it's resonant only to reduce certain switching losses, not for regulation of this frequency. So it is constant switching frequency converter. So what did we get with these results? You see, depending on type of the rectifier, the, there are different markers. Uh, describing the gain of the converter. And the higher the gain of the uh, rectifier, for example, VQR provides the highest gain among all the three operating modes, we get the best gain, the highest gain of the converter. Another issue that uh, should be mentioned that operating at very small duty cycles or very high in boost hull bridge is not advantageous because having only two switches, it means that either this or this switch operates at very small duty cycle with very high currents and very high RMS current. So the idea was is to contain this uh, duty cycle to certain range in this particular example from 0 0.3 to 0 0.7. And by this means achieve uh, beneficial uh, operation of the input side front end inverter while keeping uh, the, reaching the converter operation range. In this case, it's one to 10. What is worth mentioning when the rectifier changes its operating mode, the voltage stress is changing here. This should be taken into account during the design that uh, voltage in, in, in particular full bridge rectifier providing the lowest gain provides the highest stress on the switches. However, this typically connected to operation at higher PV voltages and lower currents. Uh, like, like, like this scene film, let me show you, remind you like here, for example, we have more voltage and less current. So it is not a big problem in this particular case. And uh, here is the efficiency. This is uh, this uh, counter plots are based on measurement of many experimental points where we just fit with thin splines in the MATLAB. So this is basically experimental efficiency just plotted better than just points. And you see that at very low voltages that VQR voltage quadruple rectifier is beneficial at medium voltage range for this uh, particular application voltage doubler is preferable at for voltages above 50 volts. The uh, full bridge rectifier is preferable as the one providing the best efficiency for the overall system. And this meaning what uh, all these rectifiers meaning the operating modes of the three mode rectifier. So this is uh, example one. So the output voltage regulation range. Okay, so I just now described how to regulate the input voltage range. 
Now the similar example for output voltage range. So this example is taken from one of the papers of uh, uh, Milan Jovanovic, uh, who unfortunately died several years ago. But this was an interesting idea that actually uh, gave me an idea to pursue this research topic. So if you have an LLC converter and we want to operate it in a wide range, due to specific operating curves of LLC converter, we can achieve a limited gain, uh, a limited operating range, input voltage range or output voltage range of the converter. And uh, it's impossible to design a viable LLC converter to a very wide range uh, without getting too much RMS of circulating power in the circuit. However, what they did, they did uh, what I showed you before, reconfiguration for the front end, front end inverter. So this inverter could operate as a full bridge or as a hull bridge, because still we have the capacitor here. Even though this is a resonant capacitor, it could serve simultaneously as DC blocking capacitor. It just should be considered during design and maybe a multi-layer ceramic capacitor should be avoided here in practice. So what actually happens here is that uh, for uh, full bridge, LLC converter, we have this range for 1 to, to 1.5. This is uh, normalized. And for half bridge, from 0 0.5 to 1. So basically, we double the voltage range. And uh, how could be this done? That smooth transition is needed. Because see that we transit from point B, for example, to point C here. Not only we need to change the operating frequency, obviously. Moreover, we need to change also the operating of the switches. So this is proposed to do by smoothly introducing changes uh, through certain period of time uh, to avoid any of current stresses. And this was show actually demonstrated. So regarding current stresses, you can see here, here is one transition, here, here is another transition between full bridge and hull bridge modes. And since this transition is done smoothly, there is no overcurrents or voltage spikes or any other issues because this uh, signal is transformer current, and this signal is the output voltage. So you see, you can achieve regulation very smoothly. Moreover, regarding the input voltage range, you can see that the red core corresponds to full bridge and the blue core corresponds to the hull bridge operation of the input uh, front end inverter. So obviously that using only one of them, it's impossible to cover all the range. And the target range was from 100 to 400 volts, for example. So what is what should be done here? Uh, as could be seen that we need to go from for, for a frequency regulation. And of course, increasing frequency, we increase the output voltage. However, when we, when we need to make a mode transition, we need to change frequency almost, almost fourfold. This is probably the main drawback of this, that we need to actually use a vari frequency variations uh, fourfold one. However, compared to uh, classical approaches, uh, meaning uh, trying to design a LLC inverter converter for the whole range, this is still beneficial because you will need much wider frequency regulations than one to four. So this is uh, one example. Another example is uh, was from Shanghai Tech from Professor Hao Yuan that uh, to, we can apply to the LLC converter a three mode rectifier. This is another three mode rectifier uh, that can work as a voltage quadrupler. And then I'm not even sure because this is a five fold and six fold gain of the rectifier. So six tupler maybe. Uh, could be called the six uh, type six mode. So again, there are two switches that could reconfigure rectifier from voltage doubler. This is conventional. Then five fold and six fold voltage multiplier rectifier. And uh, of course, we have three different gain curves based on the operation of the rectifier because the operation of the main part, the front end inverter is not changing much. What is changing only voltage stress and a little bit the quality factor of the system. So this is an example of what, what was achieved that see that when we have the lowest input voltage, uh, like 30 volts, the rectifier with the highest gain is used. Then we increase input voltage, the rectifier with lower gain is used. And at the even higher input voltage, the rectifier with minimum voltage range is used. And as would be observed, it depends on the condition of the switch. Uh, there is relatively high over-regulation of the output voltage during mode transition, but I think this could be resolved with more advanced control. And uh, regarding the efficiency, why, 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 why would we do this? Because if we stay with voltage quadruple rectifier or type four, as the author called it, this correspond to the light blue and red curves. 
at lower efficient at lower input voltages we will experience uh, more losses uh, and of course we will experience because we need to regulate down to the to the lower switching frequencies in order to step up the voltage and we will introduce more circulating energy and uh, in the converter so keeping it with, with one mode of the rectifier was not suitable if you want to achieve the highest performance so by adding two additional modes, the efficiency was improved by 1%, which is, uh, doesn't seem that much, but when you have a, a mission critical application, this could improve a lot the weight of the converter uh, because of uh, reducing the cooling system. And also, or, or maybe some of these points are not very feasible because uh, having too much losses, you need to maybe change the thermal design of your converter. Light load efficiency improvement. So one more application possibility of uh, topology morphing control is, of course, light load efficiency improvement. What do I mean? There is a work, uh, again, there is a reference from uh, University of uh, Toronto describing a low power dual active bridge operating at some point as a flyback. So how it is done, we just uh, switch diagonal. And this is equivalent to the two switch flyback converter However, to make it really flyback, we need to change the reconfigure the rectifier. That's why we need some extra switch here. However, it's not a big problem, and it could be shown this dual mode control. So everything is done to through control. Only one extra switch is added in the system. So in dual active bridge, this is a classical phase shifted single phase shift modulation with the typical course for the current of the transformer. However, in case of flyback, we achieve the discontinuous conduction mode flyback when we charge the, the main transformer starts to operate as a so-called flyback inductor because transformer typically is not used to store energy and transit it to the output. But in case of flyback, the main transformer core is the main energy storage component that is charged and discharged. So how does it work in practice? See that efficiency of the flyback mode is better at lower powers. Why? Because we are switching fewer switches and the transformer losses will be lower at lower power because we don't need to store too much in the transformer core. We don't need to generate high flux density uh, values. So you can see that at 10 Watts at this point, the flyback achieves much lower losses overall. However, at around 40 Watts, these two modes break even in losses. And at higher powers, we need to use dual active bridge mode. Uh, this is not super indicative. I think this method is useful for low, low power applications when the main power of the dual active bridge is not too high because otherwise the transformer design for both dub and flyback mode will be not very feasible or not very practical. However, if you have application below 100 or 200 Watts for some battery charging or, or maybe wireless power transfer, absolutely, feasible approach. And the last example that I wanted to show today is, of course, fault tolerance uh, to semiconductor switch faults. So you probably remember from the slides, 15 slides before this topology, this is a quasi that source bug boost DC DC converter. Uh, so why do we need a fault tolerance? Uh, here you can see this is a, a pre-industrial prototype of the mi microinverter. Typically, people overlook the one important thing that Microinverters and many other converters that need to operate at wide range of uh, temperatures, humidity, and so on uh, at harsh environments are typically filled with special environmentally protecting and thermally conducting compound inside their enclosure. Meaning that this is converters that is not easy to repair. For example, here we just removed manually uh, the, this uh, potting compound. However, this potting is not so easy to remove. So this makes uh, not practical any repair work for such a converter. So the idea is that for such a converter, uh, we still could have some critical faults or some uh, random faults due to some uh, defects in the components, <coughs> production defects, even at low rate. So why, why do we need a fault tolerance? Okay, if converter burned out. Because if you converter burned out, it may need a, an immediate replacement that could increase the maintenance cost. But if by employing fault tolerance, meaning post fault operation, we can extend its operation to the, uh, to, 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 to the nearest scheduled maintenance, which could keep your maintenance cost lower, considerably lower in some cases. So this is, as I told, the quasi source, so meaning here is synchronous quasi source network full bridge inverter, transformer with two capacitors here. One of them is resonant, another is blocking needed for reconfiguration. 
and reconfigurable rectifier. So we, uh, this concept actually combines two of the previous concept, reconfiguration in the input side and at the output side. <coughs> so yeah, coming back uh, to this topology, this is bug boost converter. So as I showed you before, by introducing shoot through in this bridge, we can do boost. By using phase shifted modulation, we can do bug. But we always need four switches for that. Uh, what happens if you have short circuit fault? So one of the switches burn out. Uh, burn out, but typically what from our experience, uh, predominantly MOSFETs are experiencing short circuit faults when we are talking about surface mounted casing and many of the silicon TO type casings. Uh, much fewer cases of the open circuit faults have been observed in our experiments. So one of the main ideas of this concept is to use this burned out switch as the current conducting path. So when we need to reconfigure the topology into, in order to achieve boost or back mode, we consider it as short circuited current path. Uh, we are still uh, doing some research to actually evaluate how stable is this current conducting path, but uh, this is another topic. So how do we get a boost converter? So if this one is burned out uh, to short circuit fault, we short circuit a diagonal switch and this is equivalent to one switch, single switch quasi the source converter. However, single switch <coughs> obviously will, would provide smaller gain and smaller voltage swing to the transformer, which means that we need to provide more uh, gain at the output side. And by this means we need to increase the reconfigure it to the from both full bridge rectifier to the voltage down the rectifier but short circuiting or turning on actually the switch so i forgot to mention that here is this extra switch this is probably the only extra component in all the circuit that is needed to make it fault tolerant and it is statically controlled so you don't need some expensive uh, gating you can get a very cheap gating circuit for it driving circuit uh, as it is statically controlled so in case of boosts, I told you, diagonals are turned on and this diagonal is controlled synchronously in order to get shoot through conditions uh, and short circuit the quasi the source network to step up the voltage. What, gonna, what we are gonna do in the back mode? Uh, we are going to reconfigure to the hull bridge. Uh, the, the, the quasi the source network is being reconfigured to the LCL filter, LC filter kind of. Uh, it's more complicated than that, but it works as LC filter basically. And after this reconfiguration, we don't touch the switch. We just uh, modulate to apply PWM only to the second uh, leg of the bridge inverter, meaning that we achieve equivalent operation of the hull bridge. And then of course, hull bridge is still provides fewer uh, gain. We need to increase the gain of the total converter by increasing the gain of the rectifier by turning on the switch SR. So what do we obtain from that? In practice, in practice, there is one issue with that that is uh, avoidable in by controls that in case of uh, pre fault or with operation without fault, the control variables and control switching sequence could be smoothly transformed from boost to back mode. However, in case of post fault operation shown in the figure on the on the right side. Uh, there is certain dead band in control, and this actually should be carefully observed during the design and control of such fault tolerant converter. Moreover, what does it mean that such a dead band uh, doesn't allow us to have a smooth transition between modes? And I will show this uh, based on experimental results. So, experimental results here: fault detection. Fault detection actually for 100 kilohertz converter. We have full detection short circuit introduced. Uh, we have been just short circuiting externally, mechanically, the switch. Uh, the full detection is less than one switching period and current of the switch is limited. So all the other healthy switches are not being overstressed during the detection. Uh, moreover, another observation that if we compare converter operation at, in normal conditions and in post fold, we can see that in post fold, the efficiency at full power is lower. Why? Because in case of post fault, as I mentioned, we need, we have only two switches in boost or in back mode processing all the same power level. So typically here is, of course, could be a question what to do. Should we operate at this lower efficiency or should we reduce operating power by, by, by curtailing the PV power? This is actually what we are 
working on right now, investigating what would provide the better efficiency or how much lifetime will be affected by operation post fault, uh, considering much, in, much increased stress on the semiconductors. And what I mentioned regarding the transition between two modes, you can see that in normal operations, the efficiency curve, uh, this is a constant power of 150 watt, I believe. So the efficiency curve is uh, smoothly uh, transitioning for, uh, from boost mode to the back mode. In case of post fault operations, there is a boost mode and there is a back mode, but they're, they're connected with a step change in the efficiency. And this is the main drawback of this approach that we actually found another solution recently by applying an other topologies to fault tolerance. Uh, but still, uh, the converter is absolutely operational, even though it has certain drawbacks post fault. And you should still keep in mind, as I told that if you can extend your maintenance time to the scheduled maintenance, you can reduce your maintenance costs. So this operation with drawback is still better than no operation at all and requirement for uh, operating it at, uh, oh, sorry, for maintaining it earlier at extra cost. So this is summary from my side that as I told that the uh, four main application extension of the input voltage range, output voltage range, fault tolerance or light load efficiency optimization. Uh, as I mentioned that every stage of the DC-DC converter could be reconfigured. So you're not limited in anything. I showed only several methods today due to scarcity of the time, but you should keep in mind that regarding the topology configuration and reconfiguration, there are much more other opportunities. Uh, you can find some resonant tank reconfigurations when uh, LLC converter is configured to CLLC, and by changing the resonant tank, you can achieve another gain core characteristics. You can achieve by bypassing switching cells or transformers, meaning that uh, you can you have ex some extra components that are not used in certain operating conditions, and uh, you can of course apply it to multi-phase and multi-level switching cells. When you can control your multi-phase or multi-level switching cells as a single. Uh, single level or two levels switching cell and by this means achieving uh, the changes in the converter overall gain. So thanks a lot for attending the webinar today. Uh, as I told that this webinar was organized with support from uh, Tallinn University of Technology and our Zero Energy Center of Excellence. And in particular, as I told, I am a chair of uh, Joint Society chapter here in Estonia section and uh, I encourage most of many of you join the IEEE and uh, to explore explore all the benefits available to us, uh, like this webinar, for example. So I will stop full screen operation and check the chat. Okay, there are too many questions in chat. mostly requesting the slides. I will I will talk with other presenters uh, regarding the slides. And uh, what about the fate of the switch, which is damaged? As I told right now, we are, we are, we are uh, investigating this because switch is intact typically. When we, are spoke, when we are talking about low power converters, switch remain intact, so it's not, uh, uh, mechanically damaged, so it's not uh, dangerous. Uh, however, uh, stability of its operation as a short-circuited current pass is not absolutely clear. Yeah, I will stop sharing because we are already over time. So, uh, yeah, right now we have a minimum number of participants through the day at 107 participants. I Thank you all who stayed so long. I thank you to all the presenters today, speakers to Gianpaolo Buticchi, Hassan from Uchugul, uh, and uh, Jose Rodriguez. Uh, and uh, we will, I, I will observe how this recording have been done and uh, what is the, uh, the quality of the recording we got. And I will ask the presenters uh, to share their presentations if possible. And uh, Gianpaolo already shared, actually, thanks for that. And uh, in the future, I think we will organize more webinars. Actually, our power electronics groups in, uh, group in Tallinn organize uh, frequently the webinars. So feel free to follow us on Facebook or LinkedIn. Uh, we advertise these webinars on different topics. And uh, in this complicated time, it allows us to stay in shape. 
and <laughs> with our knowledge and with our skills of presenting and also listening is not so bad skill too. <laughs> uh, so I think we can conclude at this point. I don't know any remarks from uh, John Paolo, Hassan or Jose. All good, Andre. Yeah, I sent you the slides uh, to distribute and thanks for organizing it. It's good to keep in shape uh, as you as you said, giving talks, listening to talks or getting half a day just for some lecture that is a good feeling. Thanks a lot for joining too. So Jose and Hassan, you can maybe say goodbye to everyone. Well, uh, I was very uh, happy to join uh, to this webinar. And uh, if you want, you can share my slides, no problem. Yeah, I will send you an email. Okay. Thank you for everybody. Uh, if you want if you want ask questions, you can send my email. Thank you so much. Bye bye. And I think Jose is not with us anymore. He is a busy person, which is obvious. So thanks to everyone. Have a good evening or day or night, whatever is your time belt. We have uh, people from all around the world. So uh, yeah, thanks a lot to everyone. Goodbye.